So let's try to summarize some of the main results and themes from the course. So we began way back in Unit 1 by looking at uh, fractals, geometric fractals. We said fractals are objects that are self-similar. Small parts of the object are similar to the whole, and that this self-similarity extends over many scales. So an example of a fractal was a fern. Um, it's late fall now where I am, and so the ferns outside aren't looking so good, but uh, this one still at least has its shape, if not its color. So if you have a fern, and you right, break a part off, you get a fern, and that fern looks like it's itself made up of little ferns and so on. And then the counterexample that we used was a person. If you have a person and you break a part of the person off, what you have doesn't look like a small little person, it looks like a creepy little arm. Okay, so that's a um, quick reminder of that. So anyway, we then said we can quantify or describe this self-similarity with the dimension d defined in this way by looking at magnification factors, how much we have to stretch up shapes, and how many small copies there are. And the d that we need to make this equation true is a self-similarity dimension. And we calculated this for a number of geometric fractals, like the Zerpinski triangle and, and so on. So that's uh, this idea of self-similarity is related to being scale-free. So if an object is similar, we say it's scale-free. So for example, there's no typical size of the bumps in a Koch curve. There's no clue as to the scale. In contrast, for a uh, tomato or a hand or a pencil, all of those have a typical size and that sets a scale. Another way to think about this is that in a fractal, if you're shrunk, you wouldn't be able to tell because there are no objects that set a size scale. You may be in a tree that consists of branches, that consists of branches, that consists of branches. There's branches of different sizes all the way up and down. Um, so there's no single branch that sets a, uh, a scale. And we noted that real fractals, physical objects like this, are not self-similar forever all the way down. There's some lower cutoff scale. Then in Unit 2, we said, all right, well, how do we generate fractals? And the answer is there are many different ways to do that. So deterministic uh, geometric iteration, just repeating uh, certain tran uh, geometric transportation, uh, transformation again and again. And also we can do that with a, 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 put a little bit of randomness in the rule or some irregularity or asymmetry. And we took a little detour and talked about how fractal landscapes can be generated. And then there's the chaos game, which generated the Sierpinski triangle by rolling dice and diffusion limited aggregation when random walkers uh, clump together and form these uh, fractal dendritic shapes. So the main picture that emerged from this exploration is that there are many simple ways to make fractals. Fractal shapes may look at first to be quite complicated, but they're actually rather simple to build. And moreover, we can have both deterministic and random iterated processes that make fractals. So, fract so processes of very different character can, can produce fractals. And so I argued that, in a sense, we can think of fractals as generic shapes, in that they're easy and there are many different simple ways to make them. So fractals um, are beautiful and look complicated, but maybe they shouldn't surprise us when we see them. In Unit 3, we looked at the box counting dimension. And um, these are the main ideas here. We looked at the number of boxes of a certain side needed to cover an object and asked, how does that change as the box size changes? And that leads to the idea of the box counting dimension. And this is a tedious but more concrete way of thinking about um, how you might define and calculate a fractal dimension. It was also in this unit that we saw our first instance of log-log plots. So that in, in this particular case, if we plotted the number of boxes versus the box size, we would um, see a straight line. And that's something we saw after this again and again throughout the course. We looked at lots and lots of log plots. So it's also when um, introduced or uh, defined more, a little more carefully this idea of scaling. So that if we have a relationship like this, um, then, and that's 
um, true for a wide range of scales s. Here s would be the box size, but it could be something more general. Then we say that this object or phenomena exhibits scaling. And the dimension, this exponent here, um, is telling us that there's something that's staying the same as the scale is changed. That as we zoom in and out, there's some relationship, some ratio of small to large that's staying the same. Okay, then in unit four, we got a little bit more abstract. And we said, all right, so we've been talking about physical fractals so far, ferns and Sierpinski triangles and Koch curves and so on. But let's look at the mathematics a little bit more abstractly. And so box counting led us to this equation. And if this equation is true, there's self-similarity, and we see a line on a log-log plot. So then we reverse that logic. So if we're looking at some other phenomena that's not necessarily a geometric shape, but we see linear behavior on a log-log plot, that's a clue, uh, an indication that there's self-similarity. And so mathematically, the general form then for a power law is power law of x is a x to the minus alpha. So then we looked at some properties of power laws. And some of the important properties are that power laws have long tails. They decay much more slowly than, for example, an exponential function. So here's a power law um, and an exponential. And so um, the exponential value, the exponential function here out at 140 is essentially zero. But the power law is very small, 0. 0.00003, but not unthinkably small. So power laws have long tails, and that means that large events, extreme events, are unlikely, but not vanishingly unlikely. We would still see them. It's very different than an exponential distribution. Also, power laws are scale-free. And one way to see that is to plot a power law on different scales, and we see that we have the same sort of shape. This is another way of saying that power laws don't contain a scale. There's no clue sort of as to scale. Um, if I remove the labels from this axis, you wouldn't be able to, to figure out what they were, even if you knew uh, what the power law was. And additionally, I argued that power laws are the only distribution that's scale-free. So if we see scale-free behavior, we know there has to be a power law. If we see a power law, we know there has to be some scale-free behavior. Another um, interesting and important property of power laws is that um, for some values of the exponent, the average does not exist. Um, and uh, for some other values of the exponent, the standard deviation might not exist. And we looked at a lot of plots like this, and I considered that St. Petersburg coin tossing game as an example. So here's an example with alphas 2.5. There is an average. This approaches um, a limit, but the standard deviation does not. It it spikes upwards and then tails down. It will continue to do that no matter how many data points you have in your data set, no matter how many experiments you do. Then in Unit 5, we looked at empirical power laws. And this was um, a little bit more technical and involved some statistics. And in brief, the main points were that estimating the exponent for a power law is tricky. If you have a data set and you think it's described by a power law, Estimating um, reliably the exponent is a difficult statistical task. Um, and in particular, um, using a least squares fit on a log-log plot, which is sort of the logical thing to do, turns out to not be a reliable way. So instead, um, the alternative is to use what's known as a maximum likelihood estimator. And we talked about the formula for that and a little bit about where that formula comes from. In addition to knowing how to get the best exponent, we also want to know how good a fit is the best fit power law. Once we have the best fit, does it describe a lot of the data or just a little bit? And so we talked some, and this was a little bit more technical, about how to estimate a p-value for our model, our fit, via bootstrapping. And also, power law behavior often has a lower cutoff. It's not a straight line for all values. And so there's a principled way, non-arbitrary way, to estimate that lower cutoff by trying different values and choosing one that leads to the best fit. Additionally, it's important 
to compare alternative models. So maybe your data is pretty well fit by a power law, but it might be better fit by something else, maybe a log normal or a stretched exponential or something. And so um, the way to do that is to find optimal parameters for the alternatives and estimate their p-values. Um, and probably better still, it's to calculate a likelihood ratio. So the details for all of this are in this important paper by uh, Closet, Chalizzi, and Newman, uh, where this is discussed much more, much more fully. But then that led us to ask some questions. All right, so does it always matter if it's a power law? Well, of course, it depends. It depends on the particular scientific questions you're interested in. In some cases, it might be important mainly just to establish that your data has a long tail, that it decays slower than exponential. Um, and it's worth noting that people talk also about heavy-tailed and fat-tailed distributions in addition to long-tailed distributions. So maybe um, for your, the particular application you're interested in, it's not that important to say, is it a power law or not? The main issue is, does it have a long tail? Um, so um, again, it's important to think about the questions you're trying to answer as you're doing your data analysis. So it's one thing to say, yeah, my data seems to be eh, reasonably well fit by a power law. Um, just like you might say, oh, there's some sort of linear trend in a data set. But it's very different to say my data is a power law or my data is linear, not just eh, has a linear trend. And so in these settings, you might want to say, well, is there any theory based under, you know, well understood theory based on first principles that would predict a power law behavior? So in general, establishing that a data set is a power law as opposed to merely is reasonably well fit by a power law um, can be a difficult task. Okay, then in unit six, we said, all right, well, how would one generate power laws? What are some processes that generate power law distributions? And this was similar to unit two when we looked at what are some processes that generated fractals. And um, the take home message is the same. There are many different ways of generating power laws. So we talked about um, rich get richer models, preferential attachment, um, certain ways of combining exponential distributions, multiplicative processes that have a lower threshold, and then a couple um, optimization schemes or uh, a network say, designed to um, optimize certain qualities would, would lead naturally to something with a power law distribution, something that was scale-free. So the main point, again, I'm sorry for shouting, is that there are many different ways of generating power laws. So what, what does this all mean? What's the upshot? Well, I think power laws are unarguably interesting they have this long-tailed behavior that's somewhat unusual. They're scale-free. Um, so they're definitely noteworthy, but they're not that unusual. They're not that outside of the, of, uh, the realm of the possible um, because there are many different ways of making them. So in particular, if you know that something is power law distributed, that doesn't uh, alone, just merely knowing that it's a power law, doesn't imply any particular mechanism. And in particular, there are very different mechanisms that can lead, uh, give rise to power laws. So random processes and um, optimality uh, considerations both give rise to power laws. In addition, thinking back to the previous unit, many empirical power laws may actually, that, that people have said, oh, this is a power law based on their data, may actually be log normal or something else because many researchers haven't compared their power law uh, claims to alternatives. So then in unit seven and eight, we looked at some particular applications of ideas of scaling. And first in unit seven, we looked at metabolic scaling. And the starting point here was the empirical relationship that the metabolic rate scales with a three quarter power law. And this is known as Kleiber's law. And this is a puzzle because if we were to assume that metabolism is determined by surface area, because creatures need to dissipate heat, then we would expect an exponent of two-thirds. Um, so I should say two-thirds and not three-quarters. So in the late 1990s, West, Brown, and Enquist put forth a model 
that um, comes up with a mechanism that explains why we would see um, three quarters, what we actually observe, and not two thirds, which is what one would predict from surface area. And the main crux of their argument is that metabolism is determined by optimal fractal, i.e. self-similar vascular networks. And their theory leads to this prediction, which is very well borne out experimentally. And interestingly, they also have some other predictions that um, biological rates, heart rate, respiration rate, would scale as m to the minus quarter, and biological times, like lifetimes, might scale as m to the plus one quarter. These are also pretty well borne out experimentally. And then lastly, we looked at urban scaling and said that many properties of cities are observed to scale, more or less. And here are just two examples, road length and GDP. And if we look at a bunch of properties of cities, we see this sort of curious clustering that some city properties scale super linearly, often with an exponent around beta 1.15. Some are linear, that's maybe not surprising, and then some are sublinear, often with an exponent that clusters around 0.85. These tend to be infrastructure sorts of things, and these tend to be socioeconomic outputs of some sort. So um, we talked a little bit about possible explanations for this, and I think there's the, the beginnings of a compelling theory, but it maybe isn't quite there yet. This is very recent work, just a couple years old. Uh, additionally, there's a lot of variation in the data. So these um, scaling behaviors that are seen are certainly not exact laws in any sense. Um, but there's definitely a trend and there's definitely variation around the trend. Both of those are interesting um, things to study and to think about. But it's curious to me, and I think to others, that there are these fairly robust scaling relationships across cities on different continents, and the scaling relationships seem to hold um, over time um, as well, if you look at one city or a set of cities decade by decade, say. So this is an ongoing and active area of research, and I think it's a particularly exciting um, place to watch for, watch for developments in complex systems over the next couple years. All right, so that's what we covered. And let me just finally try to highlight some themes, some things that I kept coming back to in my mind as I was um, thinking about the ideas from this course. All right, so first, saying something is fractal, or for that matter, a power law or scaling, is not an either-or category, I would say. So objects are more or less fractal-like, or described by power laws to a, a lesser or greater extent. Um, as opposed to an either or, yes, it is a power law, or no, it is not. Um, statistical estimation for power laws is tricky, and I think many of the sort of claims of, of power laws are sort of strong claims, saying it is a power law, not merely that it's power law-like, um, may very well be wrong or a little bit misleading. There are many, many ways to generate fractals and power laws. Um, and so what this means is that if you know that something is a power law, that's important and interesting, but that in and of itself does not necessarily reveal its essence. Why? Because very different models, very different processes can produce the same outcome. A random process, a deterministic process, um, something involving optimality. So if merely knowing something is a power law does not, um, I would say, sort of reveal its essence. So another way to think about this is observing that something is fractal or power law is usually not the end of research, but it's actually the beginning of often a very fruitful line of research. It says, hey, there's a somewhat unusual pattern here that, that suggests that there's some commonality across a lot of scales. Now let's try to learn more about that process and see what we can figure out.